Okay, welcome everyone to voter registration and outreach training. And we're gonna focus on voting rules in Ohio um, and specifically Franklin County for the upcoming November 7th general election. I'm Elizabeth Greaser. I'm with the League of Women Voters here in Columbus and we serve Franklin County. We work with all Franklin County voters that are eligible to vote. And our mission is to make sure that everyone who's eligible can vote and that they know where to find the information they need to make informed decisions when they're voting. So we've been um, doing this for 103 years. Uh, we have offices all over the county. I'm sorry, offices all over the country. We also have a, a state office here in Ohio that focuses more on advocacy. And then our local office here in Columbus, we do most of the boots on the ground voter registration. Okay, so there's quite a few things I wanna touch on tonight. Um, first is talking about Ohio's new voting laws, which just went into effect this April. And then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of registering people to vote, who can vote, the various ways you can register them. We'll talk about the three different ways that people can vote in Ohio. And then we'll also talk a little bit about what's going to be on the ballot in November. So there were new voting laws which were passed and signed by the governor in January of this year. They went into effect in August. We just a couple weeks ago got to experience these laws for the first time when everyone in Ohio was eligible to vote um, in the August 8th election for issue one. Um, so we're still in the process of analyzing how that went, um, you know, what some of the hiccups were in terms of educating voters about these laws um, and how we can make sure we are covering those gaps in the lead up to November. So we're gonna kind of talk about this a little bit throughout the presentation, but I did wanna have a couple of slides at the beginning, which just laid out the big overall changes in Ohio voting laws. So the biggest change and the one thing that I'd want you to walk away from if you don't remember anything else about the Ohio voting laws is that voters must now present a photo ID when voting in person. And voting in person means either voting at your polling location on election day or voting early at the Franklin County Board of Elections during the four weeks leading up to the election. So either of those two options, you have to show a photo ID. And there's only certain photo IDs that you can use, and we will go over that information um, in detail a little bit later on. So after the photo ID rule, which is the biggest change, there were quite a few changes to uh, various dates and deadlines of when things to be need to be turned in or requested. Um, I don't expect everyone to remember all of these deadlines, but just kind of keep in the back of your mind that there may be changes in some of these dates um, for various types of, of voting and ballots and things like that. So one of the changes is that mail-in ballots, or we sometimes call them absentee ballots here in Ohio, they have to arrive within four days of election day instead of 10. So those, if you get a ballot in the mail, fill it out, you mail it back to the Board of Elections, it has to arrive at the Board of Elections by the Saturday after election day, whereas before we, you had um, over a week to make sure that it arrived. Um, also changing is that voters who want to vote by mail need to get their application for the mail-in ballot back to the Board of Elections at least seven days before election day instead of three. Um, this, is, this is a change in the deadline, but we generally recommend, at least at the league, that if you want to vote by mail, you need to request that earlier. And we ideally recommend that you are requesting that more than seven days in advance. But technically, the deadline is now seven days. We also know now that, or 
kind of an, something that was unclear in the past has now been um, cleared up by this new law um, and that there is only allowed to be one ballot drop box per county. And a ballot drop box is looks basically like a post office box. And that's where you can put your absentee ballot. Um, you can drop it off there. So that box must be located at the Board of Elections office in Franklin County. They have that right outside their doors. Um, and you it's open 24-7 during early voting. So you can drop that ballot off at 2 a.m. if you want to. The box is secured and it is monitored um, by video recording. Uh, another change, just to keep in mind, is that there is no longer in-person voting the Monday before Election Day. They reallocated those original hours to other times earlier in the weeks um, of early voting. So the total number of hours of early voting is still the same, but there no longer is voting the day before Election Day. And um, another kind of issue that this voting law cleared up or made clearer is that curbside voting is not allowed unless a voter has a disability and is unable to enter the polling place. So curbside voting is where you can pull up to your precinct, to your polling location. Um, they should have a special spot where you can do this. You can stay in your car and vote. So you can request that a bipartisan team of poll workers come out with the ballot and you'll be able to vote from your car. So legally now, um, the only people that can use this option are people with a disability who are unable to enter the polling location. Any questions about those? That's a lot, but. Okay, this. Is it, Sorry, I have oh, go ahead. one question. The, the four day rule for the mail in ballots yes. uh, is that based on when the ballot physically arrives at the Board of Elections or is it based on a postmark date? Correct. It has to arrive at the Board of Elections, it has to be postmarked um, by Election Day. So it has to physically arrive at the Board of Elections. Um, by the Saturday after the election. Okay, it's not by the postmark date. Nope, nope. Um, um, I have a question about the curbside voting. Sure. What about the person who's driving the disabled person or is there either their driver or their caregiver, can they do the curbside voting? No, it's only the person that is unable to enter the polling. So if I'm driving somebody and I'm their caregiver and I can't leave them alone, I still can't come, I still can't get a curbside ballot. Correct. They would tell you that you would have to come back at another uh, time on your own. Yes. Okay. So these, this new rule has really tightened up what is allowed under curbside voting because as you might remember during the 2020 election, anyone was able to use curbside voting. Part of that was COVID. You know, you could just say that you were uncomfortable entering the polling location and you could vote curbside. So they really tightened that up. Um, the one thing that gives you a little flexibility is that the poll workers aren't allowed to question your statement that you are unable to enter the polling location. So they can't say, well, what's your disability or show me some paperwork that, you know, they have to just take what you say at face value. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. um, those are all great questions. And since this is a new rule, we are, you know, the, the voter rights organizations in Ohio, we are looking for voter stories and examples of you know, what happens? What were voters' experiences when they did, like, let's say you were helping, you were a caregiver for someone and you requested a, a, a ballot curbside voting as well. You know, what did they tell you? Did they allow it? Did they not? You know, I mean, technically they're, they, um, you know, shouldn't have allowed it, but we're, um, we don't have a lot of examples yet because these are new rules of what's happening in practice. And because there are 88 different 
board of elections that are run somewhat independently. Um, you know, there could be very different experiences from county to county on this. So keep that in mind. If you hear anything, you know, we definitely be interested in hearing stories from voters. So um, I worked the polls a week ago uh, as a paper ballot judge and we did curbside voting, but the person never stated a disability, they just requested. And it was obvious because they had a walker or they couldn't get out of the car or whatever. But we also had drivers of those people who said, can I vote in, you know, do, do I have to come in? And we thought they didn't, but now I know differently. Well, I mean, yes, that's my understanding that, that they aren't allowed to go in because they wouldn't fall under this disability. Um, but if you have received instruction to the contrary by Brooklyn County Board of Elections, I would be interested to hear that because in all honesty, we at the league would like as many people as possible to have access to curbside voting. So this is, you know, that's not something I'm, I'm like happy that, you know, other people were allowed to do this. Um, it's just, we, you know, we don't always we didn't, know how it's being put into practice. We didn't, we weren't giving any instruction one way or the other about the driver, or the caregiver. Um, okay. So I will ask the next time around. Yeah. And that's great. We have kind of an ongoing conversation with the Board of Elections as well. So I'm going to add that to my questions. I don't want to make it a big issue, but it is, you know, just it's um, it's an interesting thing to think about. I really hadn't thought about that particular situation before. OK, um, so. A little bit more about the new photo ID requirement. This is a good image that just lays out what was allowed before 2023 and what is allowed now in terms of ID. So to vote in person, and again, this is in person, not mail-in ballots, you have to have either a Ohio photo ID, which is a driver's license or a state ID issued by a BMV in Ohio, a US or Ohio issued military card, or a U.S. passport. Now, the passport is a new form of ID that we weren't able to use before, but there's all these other forms of ID that used to be valid that aren't anymore, and that would include any kind of utility, bank statement, paycheck that had your current address on it. So now we're, we're really limited to these three um, categories of of voter IDs that people can use in person. And then people always ask about um, whether the address on your ID needs to match the address where you register to vote. The address, the answer is no. The addresses don't have to math, match, but the ID cannot be expired. So as long as your ID is unexpired, you can use it even if the address is not matching where you're currently registered to vote. Okay, so again, just this little chart just kind of points it out. There's three different ways to vote in Ohio that we'll talk about more later, um, but photo IDs needed for election day voting and early in-person voting. You do not need a photo ID if you're doing mail-in um, ballots. Okay. Now back to the nuts and bolts of voter registration. To register to vote, you need to be a U.S. citizen. You need to be at least at least eighteen by election day. So we um, actually had a a league member last weekend who registered um, someone at a festival who is seventeen. She's turning eighteen in September. Um, so you can register people that aren't 18 currently, but they will be 18 by November 7th. So keep that in mind. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that in Ohio, as long as you're not currently serving time for a felony conviction, you can vote, you can register to vote. There's often confusion about this. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that diff different states have different rules. So in some states, if you have a felony conviction, your right to vote is taken away forever. But in Ohio, as long as you're not currently in jail or in prison, 
you can register to vote. The caveat here is that when you're convicted of a felony and serving time, your voter registration is um, you know, no, no longer valid. So then when you get out of prison, you do need to re-register to vote. Here's a couple uh, other a question, special populations. Oh, go ahead. Um, if the individual is out on parole, are they eligible to vote? Yes. They're staying at a halfway house. They can register to vote. As long as they're not in jail, they can vote. We're supposed to be in jail. <laughs> well, yes. But um, as long as they're, uh, if they're on parole, you know, they can register. There's also many individuals in jail who are just there either awaiting trial or for misdemeanors, and they can um, register and, and vote as well. Those are not people you would generally come across, though, um, unless you were going into the jails to, to do outreach. Um, but another, another population that has some special considerations, especially given the new voter ID laws, would be transient or homeless individuals. You don't have to have a permanent residence in order to register to vote or to vote you can register using an address at a local homeless shelter or community organization that will accept mail on an individual's behalf. So um, if, an in, if someone is staying at a shelter, if they're getting their meals at a you know, community organization, um, many of those organizations will let individuals use their address as, um, you know, as a voter registration address. And technically, you can register by saying, my residence is the park bench on the corner of Main Street and Front Street. And that's valid. But the problem with that is that you can't really get mail easily. You don't have a mailbox uh, for the park bench on the corner of Main Street and Front Street. So um, we, we don't recommend that, even though technically you can use that as an address for someone to register to vote. Um, but so some, a lot of individuals who are homeless aren't aware that they can register and just use another address of a place that they can get mail. Um, but you know, you if you are in a situation where you are registering people that are homeless to vote, there's a number of things you should be aware of. Um, you know, you definitely would wanna talk about ID requirements on election day. Um, talk through the different options for voting, what would be easiest for them. You know, this is a population that is less likely to have that required um, ID. Um, so you may want to consider absentee voting. However, and we're going to get into this more, there's a couple different steps for absentee voting and it does require follow-up. Getting mail, you know, having postage, things like that. And then registering college students. This has been a big question mark since the new voting laws came into place earlier this year. And the question mark here has to do with out-of-state students who want to vote in Ohio. Um, so before a student, let's say that their family is from Pennsylvania, and they're going to Ohio State, they could vote in person on election day and they could bring in just a utility bill, like their their water bill for the apartment that they're renting on campus. And they could vote using their campus address um, so that they'd be voting in Columbus. Now they can't do that anymore. They have to show that photo ID and we know that when an out-of-state individual applies for an Ohio ID or an Ohio driver's license, that will invalidate any home state license or ID. So that means if they have a driver's license in Pennsylvania and they go in to the BMV in Ohio and say, I want to get an Ohio state ID so that I can vote, as soon as they get that ID, that means that their driver's license in Pennsylvania is no longer valid, even though they're not getting an Ohio driver's license. It's just, you can only have one official state ID at a time. Um, 
So that kind of it brings up some questions about what should we tell out of state college students to do? Um, we, you know, can recommend that they vote early with an absentee ballot because they would only have to use the last four digits of their social. Um, but we've also gotten some mixed messages from colleges about students who receive um, financial aid and they're out-of-state students if now the fact that they're trying to vote in Ohio would somehow mess up their financial aid. So it's a little bit of a conundrum. We did not have a whole bunch of students voting in the August election because most schools weren't in session. So really we're gonna be dealing with this for the first time in November. Um, and we'll be trying to figure out the best uh, course of action and way forward and you know what best to recommend to college students who are going to school in Ohio, but they are out of state. Does anyone have any questions about that? Elizabeth, if they have a passport, can they use that? Yes, they can use a passport to vote in person. Okay, and that would not invalidate any license or ID. No, that should not, you know, cause cause a problem. So problems. that's that's something that we can recommend to them. Um, how, I. How about, a, how about a military ID? Not a lot of college students will have passports, right? They they can use that military ID. Um, however, m one of the military IDs that you can use is an Ohio military ID. So an out of state student wouldn't have that. Um, there is a U.S. military ID that they could use. Um, I, you know, there may be a few people that students that have that, but I my guess is that the vast majority of students would not right. uh, would not have that. I did do a presentation to some younger voters who were college age recently. And I was talking about absentee ballots and I was talking about, you know, putting postage on your absentee ballot to, you know, get it back to the board of elections and someone raised their hand and they asked, what is postage? So I just mentioned that as kind of a, an, uh, example of maybe like a difference in generation um, of younger people who are not used to going to the post office or know how to acquire stamps, um, things like that. So just, you know, something to keep in mind if you are working with this, um, this particular group. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, the next couple slides are close-ups of the voter registration form. It's all the same form. It's one sheet of paper, but this way you all can see the, the questions. The form is used to register first-time voters. It's used to um, update mm -hmm. a voter's address, and it's also used if there's any name changes that needs to be made. So this one form is for all three situations. If you're registering voters, you want to make sure that they're checking questions one or two that often gets missed. Um, another place that that gets missed is question eight, which is the county where you live and not the country. For voter registration, you don't have to worry about photo IDs at all. You just need to put your birth date and you can either put your driver's license number or your social security. I do recommend that people put their phone number in, even though it's voluntary, just because, for example, if someone is handwriting this form and the staff of the Board of Elections can't make out their writing, they at least have a way to contact the voter and you know either get the correct information or let them know that they'll have to refill out the form. Okay, this is the middle part of the form. If you're a new voter, you just leave it blank. But if you're updating your address or changing your name, you would fill out this portion. And then finally, we have the bottom part of the form where you want to make sure the voter is putting today's date. Um, you'd be surprised how many people put their birth date in this portion. And then they need to sign it. And the signature does need to fit within that dotted 
box. Okay, so I went over most of these. Um, let's see, anything I didn't mention. You cannot register to vote using a PO box. It has to be a physical address so that the Board of Elections can assign you the correct polling location. I think everything else I covered. Okay, if you're doing a voter registration drive like with the League of Women Voters, often we return other people's forms for them to the Board of Elections. And these are the rules. You have to return the forms within 10 days of it being completed or the voter registration deadline, whichever is earlier. So the voter registration deadline for this upcoming election is October 10th, and it needs to be returned. Um, I highly recommend the Board of Elections office, it's 1700 Morse Road. You can technically return it to the Secretary of State's office downtown, um, but then they just go ahead and ship it up to the Board of Elections. Um, and plus they're not used to getting these forms returned to their office. So um, that's another reason why I, I recommend just returning it to the Board of Elections office. And the form um, can be mailed as well. It does not have to be returned in person. So after you register someone to vote, you wanna let them know what they can expect next. Within 20 days of receiving the form, the Board of Elections needs to mail out follow-up information to the voter, which they'll let them know their polling location, when the next election is, they'll tell them what all the ID requirements are, you know, just general things like that. Be aware that that is 20 business days, so it can often take up to four weeks for a voter to get that confirmation. It really depends on how busy the Board of Elections is at that time. We covered voting on a hard copy form, and I want to do that first before talking about online voter registration because it is the same information that you're entering online that you just put in that you put in the form. So since 2017 we have had the ability to register online in Ohio. You can do that on the Secretary of State's website and this is the the address. Um, really if you go to voteohio.gov that'll give you clear links to a bunch of different useful voting information and that includes registering online. So you can register for the first time, you can update your address um, or your name using this form. The only people that I would recommend not use this form is if you are new to the state and you don't have a presence in the Ohio state government system. So in order to verify and process your information, if you register online, they go and look up your information on other state sites. Like if you pay taxes in Ohio, like you'll have a profile or if you have a driver's license um, so they can verify your identity. If you just moved here from let's say Montana, you've never been here, never paid taxes and never had any contact with the state of Ohio, you'll have to fill out a hard copy form because they won't be able to verify you say who you are um, if they aren't able to double check that through other state sites. So I've yeah. one thing I've run into is if somebody is updating their vote their address for um, uh, for for their voter registration, but they haven't yet updated their address with the BMV, it'll reject it. Uh, yes, because that's a good tip because they clash. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. I'm gonna start using that, Chris, in my examples because that's I feel like that's more common than the Montana Montana example. Don't they also on the online form require both for, for both the uh, last four and your and your and a driver's license state ID number? They shouldn't. But I they should I just like request I've... one. But occasionally, yeah. I I am gonna say occasionally the online form is a little wonky and people okay. will say oh they were rejected and they didn't understand why. My recommendation is if someone's rejected, just have them fill out the the hard copy form because oh. it might be them or it just might be the system that day is <laughs> not um so it, it it generally works but you know as chris was saying there definitely are situations in which you think you should be able to update it online and it, it's not going through it, it is nice to like not worry about somebody's handwriting 
Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, yes, so online registration and hard copy registration. If you are out in the community doing voter registration, we suggest that you start the conversation instead of saying, are you registered to vote? You can say, have you checked your voter registration lately? And the reason we recommend that you do that is because there are a number of reasons why a voter might have been taken off the voting rolls, even though they thought they were registered. And one reason is voter purges. These are, um, you know, in the Ohio Revised Code that the Secretary of State um, should do regular voter purges. The last one was in February of this year, and 124,000 Ohioans were purged from the voting rules, rolls. Many of these Ohioans, or people that were on the rolls, they were purged because they either passed away or they moved out of state, very valid reasons for doing so. Um, however, we have had experiences in which people were taken off the rolls accidentally, um, and there's also a rule that if you haven't voted in a certain number of years, and there's a Supreme Court case which lays out all the rules, um, you will be taken off of the rules for inactivity. So it's possible that if you haven't voted in a while, you think you're registered, but actually you're not. You are taken off the rules for inactivity. Thomas, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I actually wanted to go back to the question that Chris was asking. Sure. So so it says on the form, um, you need a, an Ohio driver's license or last four digits of your social security number. But then it goes on to say one form of ID required to be listed or provided. What does that mean? <laughs> that just means, um, that just means that you need to list out the digits you need to write out the digits of your id they're what they're trying to do and this is based on the new law is to say that the ohio driver's license or the ohio state id is the preferred form of identification when you fill out these forms um and it may be the preferred one but they have to accept the social security number as well and the vast majority of individuals that i've encountered just use their social security because most people have it memorized. And I don't know, maybe most people have their driver's license number memorized, but I don't. So I would always just put my social security number because I would have to like dig in my wallet and find my license and all that. Um, so they revised the form to kind of make it sound like you have, you know, to make it sound like the date ID is the preferred method, but both work. Okay, it's just confusing because um, they say listed or provided. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, okay. I see what you're asking. Um, you can provide a photocopy of the ID okay. if you want to. I don't know many people that do that, but you can send in a photocopy of the ID. Okay. And then I'm trying to recall, and I I don't. Are there cases where an Ohio resident can have a alternate ID just instead of a social security number and still be a US citizen and eligible to vote? Um, well, for voter registration, you have to have either that Ohio state ID number or the social security. So. Okay. I'm not sure it could be possible that you don't have a social security number and you also don't have the state ID, but you wouldn't be able to register to vote using that. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit past registering. When we are out in the community registering voters, we like to have people check their voter registration status, and this is a good way of introducing a conversation um, and just saying, like, hey, would you, you know, have you checked your voter registration status in a while? And most people would say no. 
Um, and there is a website, the Secretary of State's website. Again, it's a very easy lookup and it doesn't need a lot of personal information. It's just first name, last name, and county. If you put in your name and the county you're residing in and your name and your current address comes up, then you're all set. You're registered at your current address. If what comes up is your name and then a previous address, you'll know that you need to update your voter registration address to your current address. And then if nothing comes up, it means you're not in the system. And when in doubt, we always recommend just fill out a new voter registration form. It never hurts. They just, the Board of Elections will take that new registration form. And even if you already have a current one on file, they'll just put in that new information with the new date and um, and you'll be processed. So there's no harm in, if you're not sure, just filling out the form again. Okay, so on to voting options. We talked about this a little bit already, but a few more details. On election day, November 7th, polls will be open 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. You can vote as long as you are in line at 7.30. Early voting will take place starting October 11th at our local Board of Elections office. And it's usually business hours, so about nine to five. Um, the last weekend, I think it's actually, this might be incorrect. It might just be the last weekend before election day. There are, there are um, hours that you can come and vote. And then remember, there's no hours on the Monday before election day. And each board of elections in each county has the same hours for early voting. So no matter if you're in Cuyahoga or Franklin, County, each early voting center is always open the same hours. And then, of course, you can do absentee mail-in ballots. Um, that starts at the same time as early voting, August 11th. And you have to apply for your ballot by, for your ballot by October 31st. A little bit more about absentee ballot applications. You do need to request an absentee ballot before every election if you want to vote by mail. You will have to do that by a hard copy form. You cannot do that online. Occasionally, the Secretary of State's office will mail out these absentee request forms to all registered voters before the fall election, but they are not going to be doing that this year. Uh, they, I've been hearing rumors that they're not going to do this ever again, but I am not sure if that's true. Um, it's possible that they might do that before the presidential election in 2024. But for our purposes, 2023, they're not going to mail out these uh, these requests. You can get request forms online. You'll have to print it out. Or you can get them at um, the Board of Elections office. You can get them at libraries. You can get them at city government offices as well. Most of them will have that. And you do need to, I think I have a picture of it actually in the next slide. Okay, yep. Here's the picture of what the absentee ballot application looks like. It's asking for similar information as the voter registration form. You're gonna wanna put in number three the address where you're registered to vote. But for number four, you can put any address you want. So you don't have to have the address, you don't have to have the ballot mailed to the address where you registered. It can be anywhere. And it doesn't have to be in Ohio either. If you know you're gonna be in Florida for the whole month of November and October, and you wanna vote in Ohio, you can just have the ballot be sent down to Florida where, wherever you're staying. For the ID, you can use your social security number or the driver's license number or state ID. And then again, or, or the third option is you can provide a copy, a photocopy of any of those photo IDs. Um, uh, on, on the, uh, the mailing, uh, if somebody is going to be out of the country, yes, will they not mail it? <laughs> I would yeah, you need to go through another process for oh. out of the country. Yep. Okay. And it's a, I was, so this summer I was helping someone who is a permanent resident of Ohio, but they are living temporarily in Costa Rica, 
figure out how to do this. And it was a quagmire, but we got it figured out. If you know somebody who is going to be out of the country and needs to receive that ballot, um, there's an, there's, that's a whole other training, I guess I would say. Okay. Um, and um, we can kind of help them individually. Yeah, I don't have a per someone who's out there permanently as much as somebody who's who's leaving right, right before early you know early voting begins okay. and coming back after the election. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Um. Uh, they've got some sort of student program that that with like oh, counselors yeah. and stuff. So okay. maybe they they'll figure out some. Yeah, and some maybe way like that. you know, my guess is that if it's if it's like a student studying abroad. I am not really an expert in all these different rules for voting out of the country. Because if you're in the military, there's a whole other set of rules. Sure. Um, it's quite possible that the school that they're studying with is kind of taking care of that or has an easier way to access that. But if you're an individual American citizen living outside of the United States, um, you know, there's a there's a whole State Department website which will sure. help walk you through that. And we can help people as well um, if, if they need that help. So this form is is really just for the United States. So you can get it mailed anywhere in the United States. If you're going anywhere outside the United States, then don't fill this out. You'll need to go through another process. Okay. Elizabeth, is it still yes. the case that no reason needs to be given for requesting an absentee ballot? Correct. You don't have to give a reason. Anyone can vote absentee. And you can also register to vote at the same time as you're filling out your absentee voting application. So we often will turn in at the same time the voter registration form with the absentee ballot request. Um, so you don't have to wait until you're in the system before you request your absentee ballot. They can process that at the same time. And then you can start requesting absentee ballots now for the November election, they won't be mailed out till October 11th, but if you just wanna check that off your list and you know you wanna vote absentee, then um, by all means, you should go ahead and, and do that. If you change your mind and that happens, um, let's say you've requested an absentee ballot, it gets mailed to your house, then you see the ballot and you think, oh, actually, yeah, I'm gonna go vote in person. So you don't ever turn in your absentee ballot, you shred it, and then you go vote in person on election day you will be required to vote a provisional ballot which is a paper ballot that won't be counted until the board of elections can verify that you didn't double dip so that you that they had to go back and make sure that you didn't fill out your absentee ballot your mail-in ballot send that in and then also try and vote in person on election day and generally those do get counted because they just go back to the office they check and make sure that they haven't already received um, a mail-in ballot from you, and then they'll go ahead and they'll count the in the in-person election day ballot. Um, but that's just another hurdle. So I usually tell people that if they're not, don't request an absentee ballot unless you're really pretty. You're like ninety-eight percent sure that that's how you want to vote. Okay, some people are a little concerned about using the mail-in process just because there's a number of steps. There is a way you can track your absentee ballot. You have to sign up for it at the Board of Elections website, but it works great. It's pretty much like tracking an Amazon pa package and I've used it several times. There are three checkpoints where you'll get either an email or a text from the board saying that they've received or they've sent something out so you can know where you are in the process. So you'll um, get a text or an email when the absentee ballot application that you filled out and mailed is received by the Board of Elections. You'll get a notification when they've mailed out your ballot. And then you'll get a third and final notification when your ballot's been received back to the Board of Elections. I think this is our, our final topic. So what's gonna be on the ballot in November? There are gonna be quite a few things on the ballot uh, in Franklin County, you'll be voting on whatever local city council, um, whatever city or suburb you live in, that, that city council, your local school board races. Um, some cities have mayoral races or, or city attorney races. 
There's also going to be a number of municipal judges up for election, and that's a countywide race. In Columbus, one thing to um, keep in mind is that Columbus is instituting a new way of organizing their city council. So before, or currently, there are six city council members. They're all at large members. City council is transitioning to a nine member council and each of these council members will have their own district. So um, it's a little bit like going to a ward system. However, everybody, all voters in Columbus still are gonna vote for all nine city council uh, district candidates, regardless of where they live. So we're gonna have a hybrid system in which everybody votes for everybody, everybody votes for all the races, but the city has been divided into nine different districts and each district has a specific city council member assigned to that district. So our main concern here at the league is that people won't realize that and they'll think, oh, I live in district three, so I'm only gonna vote for the district three candidates and not know that they should be voting in all nine of the districts. We're trying to get that word out. And okay. then, we have some interesting ballot issues that are going to be coming up. We know there are two statewide issues. One is the choice choice abortion, abortion. Issue, and issue. the other is and recreational other. marijuana. There's going to be a lot of publicity and ads and all kinds of stuff about that coming up. Um, the league is going to have a nonpartisan issue explanation with pros and cons on each of these issues. That'll probably be available in about a month. And then if you live in the city of Columbus, there is going to be a school levy as well as a library levy. If you live in other cities in the county, there's kind of, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of different smaller levies um, and, and other issues. But these are kind of the main things that will be on the ballot. Okay, so some... Get out the vote resources that we have here at the league. We have what's called power the vote cards. That is our nonpartisan palm card. It's about the size of a postcard. It has a lot of what I just covered here, but very summarized. It has the ID information for voting, um, the different three ways that you can vote in Ohio and a few other things. We will also have on vote411.org our local candidate guide, which includes information on all candidates who um, are running for office here in Franklin County. We send out a survey and they answer the questions in their own words. So we don't do any editorializing on that. And then we'll also have our nonpartisan issue explanations. And we have some specific postcard size hard copy materials on voting with felony convictions, voting with disabilities and election protections. Um, and we've been using to pretty good success when we're out in the community, um, these signs with QR code so that voters can look up their voter registration and what legislative district they live in. So, um, and that's been working pretty well. Okay, election protection. We encourage voters to use this on election day um, or during early vote if they experience problems voting or they're turned away from the polls. This is um, staffed by attorneys. It's a national hotline. So calls are coming in from all over the, the country. Um, but these people can help them work through the problem. Or they, um, you know, another positive of this is that they can collect information on what's happening on the ground. So for example, if there is problems with curbside voting, and we're getting a lot of complaints from a particular county that people are trying to vote curbside and they're being turned away, um, you know, we can try and address that, you know, day of, but then we also have information. We also can use that information in the future to talk with that board of elections after the, after the fact and say, Hey, we received a lot of complaints. You know, what are your plans for correcting this for, for the next upcoming election cycle? And then since we talk so much about voter IDs, if you come across a voter who does not have the required ID for voting and they're interested in, in getting that ID, we are working with 
a national nonprofit called Vote Writers, and they help people secure the background documentation that they might need to get a voter ID with the BNB, and that includes um, birth certificates, social security cards, they'll pay for, you know, trying to get a certified copy of those documents and help people get to the BNB to um, assist with that process. And then just a few tips for voter outreach. If you are out in the community or you're volunteering with the League of Women Voters for one of our many voter outreach events, it's, um, it's pretty common sense. Just be friendly. Um, you know, start with a question. We talked about like, have you checked your voter registration lately? If someone says, no, you know, that they're not interested, don't press them. Just kind of say thanks and, and move on. Um, well, the most important thing is to be nonpartisan. If, if you're doing, you know, you can do voter registration with a political party and then by all means, you don't need to be nonpartisan. But if you are working at a League of Women Voters event, we require our volunteers to be nonpartisan. That means you can't agree with a voter that, oh, yes, yeah, such and such candidate is so terrible, or I really love this candidate, and you can't wear, you know, vote for so-and-so buttons on your shirt when you're when you're out doing voter registration for us. And, um, and you'll also just keep in mind that sometimes it takes a voter, a person being asked five times or seven times or eight times before they kind of take they take action on either registered to vote or remembering that there's an election coming up and that they need to find out information about the candidates and issues before election day. So just being out there and talking to the community really has a positive effect on civic engagement and getting people interested in voting. And that's it. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording and then if you all have questions, you can ask me without fearing that it's gonna be making it on the recording. I can figure it out.